Okay, then, uh, hello there. Uh, thank you for coming. I'm Kentaro from Japan. Uh, my hometown, Tokyo, is only 15 hours away from Torino. <laughs> Do you know Japan? And Japan is famous for sushi, Mount Fuji, and <coughs> Ruby. Ruby program language is developed by Matt in Japan. So Ruby on Rails is popular in Japan. Our service, Cookpad, uh, that is a recipe sharing service, is almost later in Ruby on Rails, and there is a little bit of Golang. There are 2 million recipes and 50 million unique users. Cookpad app is downloaded over 20, uh, 20 million in Japan. Uh, the uh, back end of our service is spoken in the slide, uh, the recipe for the world's largest Rails monolith. Uh, if you are interested in large monolithic architecture, see the slides. Anyway, Cookpad is expanding our businesses to new markets such as Latin America, uh, Southeast Asia, and other countries. Emerging markets are leading smartphone growth. Uh, it is said that emerging markets will overtake developed nations in smartphone. At the beginning of this year, uh, I was in Indonesia for months to experience actual life in Indonesia. Uh, I felt that not everyone is on the fast phone and not everyone is on the fast network. The greatest challenges in those countries are harsh internet environments like low bandwidth and uh, low spec devices. Uh, for example, according to Akamai Technologies, uh, internet connection speed in Indonesia is five times slower than in Japan, and Latin America is slower than that. Uh, it is becoming increasingly important for mobile engineers to guarantee stable service and uh, an environment. Uh, I'm rebuilding the Android app for new markets. In my talk, I'd like to share some knowledge, what we learned uh, under following topics, uh, efficient HTTP communication, uh, image optimization, and API design. Uh, let's start with HTTP. Uh, this is a good place to start this talk. Uh, this figure shows the architecture of our service. There are proxy servers in front of app servers, and app servers look cast servers I think this is a common architecture. And now, uh, we'll look at network more closely. Uh, we are using Stesla to inspect network. Uh, Stesla is our debug bridge for Android apps that is developed by Facebook. Stesla helps us to debug our apps. Uh, we can see network, view hierarchy, can access SQLite database and provide many more functions. Uh, in the beginning, we'll examine HTTP headers. Uh, let's focus on these headers. First, compressing data. Compression is a simple, effective way to save bandwidth and speed up your service. Enabling ZZIP compression can reduce the size of the response by up to 90%. Okay, then, how do we compress data? First of all, set accept encoding header to the request. And next, make sure to enable ZDIP on your proxy server. If you enable ZDIP on proxy servers, proxy server return compress the response with content encoding header. Uh, by the way, there are some HTTP clients and Android the world, you know, are. Uh, Android HTTP client and HTTP URL connection don't support ZZIP by default. Uh, so if you use Android HTTP <coughs> client or HTTP URL connection, uh, you need to decompress response or manually. And uh, Android HTTP client is now deprecated. You should use other HTTP clients. Uh, we had used Blay as a API client before. Uh, Blay has two HTTP clients internally. 
If OS version is gingerbread or later, uh, Blay uses HTTP URL connection. Otherwise, Blay uses Android HTTP client. Uh, in addition, HTTP URL connection uses OKHTTP OK internally. So it means that I was using three HTTP clients uh, intentionally, and those behavior is uh, sometimes different. Uh, simple is better, right? I recommend to use OKHTTP. OK OKHTTP OK supports DDIP by the port. In addition, OKHTTP OK also supports connection pool, uh, WebSocket, and HTTP2. I said goodbye to Blay. Now we are using OKHTTP OK and Alex Java. We don't like callbacks, so we decided not to use async task and async task loader anymore. Uh, I not take up reactive programming in detail in this talk, uh, but it works pretty good. Uh, go back to the topic. Uh, next, caching data. Uh, effective cache control will dramatically reduce server load. OK, HTTP has this cache internally. And needless to say, caching role is based on cache control. By default, cache is disabled. If you want to enable cache, all you have to do is set cache instance to OK, HTTP client. Uh, then check whether the cache control is enabled on the server side. Uh, for example, we are using Ruby on Rails, so I call expires in. Uh, if I call expires in one number, uh, Rails set cache control with max age 3,600. Uh, let's see how cache works. Uh, when I request recipes, uh, OK HTTP emits a request to the server. The server returns a response. OK HTTP saves a response to the local stage. Then OK HTTP returns a response. OK, next, I request the recipes just right before. Uh, but OK HTTP has already cached response. So OK HTTP checks freshness lifetime of the cache. If the cache is valid yet, OK HTTP returns a res cached response in no time. Uh, if we attempt to call put or post or delete a request, OK HTTP delete the cached response from <coughs> local stage. <coughs> and uh, in some situations, such as after user clicks our uh, refresh button, it may be necessary to skip the cache and fetch the data directly from the server. <coughs> so I enable to set no cache to HTTP client if needed. Our API client is like this. If device is not connected, uh, I set only cache to skip some processes. Uh, thereby, users can see contents quickly even if device is not connected. Uh, I turn off Wi-Fi. <coughs> but OK HTTP has a cache, so we can see contents. Uh, to enjoy the benefit of caching, uh, you need to write carefully crafted cache control policies. Server-side cache can be purchased in any time but client-side cache can't be purged from server-side. So uh, you should not enable cache to models that are required of real-time updating. Now let's move on to image optimization. Uh, image size is much larger than JSON response. Uh, reducing image sizes would reduce the amount of data downloaded and result in quicker downloads, especially on high latency networks. First, we need to know what image loading needs. It shows that the flow of simple image loading. Specify URL to HG client, get input stream, decode input stream to bitmap, set bitmap to image view. Uh, but do you fetch images from the server every time you want to display images, even if the image has been already displayed once? Uh, the answer may be no. Uh, we want to load images from cache if possible. 
In addition, we want to reuse worker threads, uh, set the priority of requests, cache the coded images right. <coughs> uh, there are some great libraries to load images like Picasso, Glide, Flesk, and so on. Uh, I'll explain how these libraries work and how to optimize image using Picasso. Again, caching data. Cache is the best way to display contents quickly. Picasso has two caches, memory cache and this cache. This cache is the function of OKHTTP. Picasso can use OKHTTP as image downloader. <coughs> Expiration times of cache is also following cache controls. Uh, Picasso set up cache automatically, so you don't need to do anything to enable a cache. Thread pool. We need to request images from worker threads because we can't block main thread, but creating new threads for each task incurs overhead. Thread pool is useful in this kind of situation. A thread pool is a group of pre instantiated idle thread which stand ready to be given work. Uh, this kind of library is often implemented as a producer consumer pattern. Uh, our producer requests a image from main thread, our task is enqueued, consumer fetch the task, and process it. When the task is done, send the result to main thread slow handler. Uh, there is a trade off between capacity and resource. Uh, if there are many workers, tasks are processed concurrently, but if there are too many workers, consume memory wastefully. So uh, both Picasso and Glide has a fixed thread pool internally. The number of core threads of Picasso depends on network connectivity. Uh, the number of core threads of Glide depends on the number of CPU cores, like this. Uh, it is difficult to say which setting is better uh, because it's depending on network environment, device spec, image size, transformation, and more factors. Uh, bottleneck varies by app. Uh, by the way, Flesco, that is a new image loading library developed by Facebook, has uh, taken an interesting approach. Flesco has multiple executors and they use it properly. I think this is a good idea. I'll try to use Fresco soon. Uh, next, queue management. Channel is often implemented using priority blocking queue because priority blocking queue can manage prioritized tasks. Uh, we can set priority to request like this. I'll sh show how I manage tasks, uh, this is the case of Picasso. Uh, when a user searches recipes, uh, requests are added to the queue, then uh, the user opens recipe detail screen, uh, requests are added uh, to the end of the queue as usual. But uh, if I set high priority to the main image, the request is added to the top of the queue, like this. And when I use a back to recipe list screen, I can call cancel tag to dispose useless request. Uh, this is a queue management of Picasso. Uh, Glide has lifecycle integration, so Glide's behavior is different from Picasso. When the user opens the recipe detail screen, uh, requests are paused automatically. Then new requests are added to the queue. Then user back to recipe list screen, requests are canceled automatically, and the paused requests are restarted. We don't need to set priority because Glide manages the queue automatically. But uh, that has good sides and bad sides. For example, Glide adds viewless fragment to each activity to observe lifecycle events. Bitmap pool. Uh, each pixel takes up four bytes and bitmap consume a lot of memory. 
allocating memory every time to transport midges are not efficient. So Glider has bitmap pools, so bitmap is reused to avoid unnecessary allocations. Uh, but uh, bitmap pool uh, works efficiently if all this version is KitKat or Uber, because bitmap management of Android framework is changed from KitKat. Next image format. Uh, we are using WebP. That is an image format developed by Google. Uh, WebP lossless images are 26% smaller in size compared to PNG images. And WebP loss images are 25 to 34% smaller in size compared to JPEG images. Uh, I compared image size. Uh, this figure shows 70% quality of WebP is the most efficient in our service. So basically, uh, we are distributing images at 70% of quality of WebP by the port. Uh, next image size. Uh, there are many display sizes in Android. Small devices don't require large images. So we are request an appropriate image size for the viewport like this. Because of that, we are using image transformation server called TOFU. TOFU transforms images on the fly. Uh, TOFU has functions like uh, resize, crop, specify quality, and so on. Uh, in addition, we request different image size depends on network quality. Uh, I look network type to detect network quality for now. I try to use uh, network connection class that is developed by Facebook. Uh, but uh, calculating collected round tri trip time was uh, difficult. Uh, anyway, low images are 40% smaller than full images. Uh, this is a last topic, API design. Uh, if API responses become faster, users become happier, is it right? Of course, the answer is yes. Uh, let's use partial response to reduce data size. But be careful, uh, Android has stayed on screen transition. For example, users uh, go back and forth to decide a menu. Uh, you don't want to see progress dialog many times like this, do you? Uh, response time is important, but UX is more important. If you use partial response, you should think user behavior. Uh, distance between phone and the server is very, very, very long, uh, particularly in emerging markets. Uh, you should not request to server very often. So uh, you should reduce unnecessary fields using partial response, uh, and uh, you should get appropriate fields and relations. Uh, what data is necessary in the screen is only mobile engineers know. <laughs> So you should involve API design for users. Uh, one more thing to improve experience. Our response includes some like data URI. Uh, that is base64 encoded image. Uh, the image is 10 pixels on four sides, and size is uh, 0.4 kilobytes. Thereby, we can display images as soon as response arrived. Uh, this size is smaller, but there is a big improvement of body sensation speed. Documentation. Uh, keeping the documentation updated in real time is hard, right? We are working on separated time zone. There are times when I can't have a reply soon, so documentation is important. Uh, we are using JSON schema as the format for describing our APIs. Uh, JSON schema provides these functions 
to maintain API server easy. JSON schema checks request and response type automatically. And generate API documentation from schema file. Uh, we don't need to update documentation manually. We can spend more time for improving UX. Conclusion. Uh, I talked about those performance tips. Uh, keep in mind, all things are for users, and only mobile engineers can know how to optimize it because the person who is the most closest to users in all of developers is a mobile engineer. I think this skill is becoming more important in future. That's all. Thank you for listening. <laughs>